John Henry Cole is captain. Boss man, do you ever pray? Well, if I miss this deal, let this hammer get away. Mara be your barren day. Lord, Lord. Let Mara be your barren day. This is on mass, bringing together stories of struggle and hope from the working class. I'm your host, Liz Medina. You are listening to episode 11, our final episode of this season, titled You Got Something Behind You, featuring the story of Denise Gilmet. Denise currently works as a granite expediter, but used to be a sandblaster. She is also the president of the Granite Cutters Association. In the previous episode, we heard Randy's story. Randy is a water department work leader for the city of Barrie and president of ASME Council 93. His hard work ensures that the water in Barrie keeps on flowing, including all the water consumed in the production of granite memorials. He has also spent time taking care of those memorials while working in Hope Cemetery. In 2018, I had the chance to see how most memorials are manufactured. I'm not talking about hand-carved memorials done by people like Gompo and Donegal from Episodes 7 and 3. I'm talking about simpler ones, maybe with some floral or other decorative flourishes that you could pick up from a catalog. Denise graciously invited me to her workplace at Global Values, a memorial manufacturer in Barrie, Vermont. Miles before I arrived at the industrial complex where Global Values is located, I could hear the low hum of the factory. The industrial complex is a patchwork community of businesses housed in corrugated steel buildings. Global values appear to be the biggest of them all. Through several entrances and exits, giant blocks of granite came in and out, as did freshly caffeinated or exhausted workers. It took me a while to find the proper entrance, but it didn't take me long to find the source of the low hum. That came from their ventilation system. It's a giant copper-faded green contraption. In a way, it's a monument to the legacy of organized labor, which Denise keeps alive with her co-workers. It may seem strange, but I remember being happy to see it. It's not an especially beautiful memorial, like the Italian Carver's Memorial in Barrie, featuring a carver standing proud in his smock, chisel in one hand and hammer in the other, but perhaps it's a more concrete one. It's loud and persistent hum, a proclamation that workers' lives are valuable. As I waited for Denise outside, I beheld this industrial giant and wondered how else we might apply our ingenuity to improving working conditions instead of just improving a company's bottom line. What if we use technology and automation to make better jobs instead of making them more monotonous and scarce. Technology and automation could make jobs safer, as well as give workers back more money and time. Granite is not easy to work with. It breaks tools and backs. Granite is so tough that diamond blades are needed to cut through it. It's as hard as steel, sometimes harder depending on the crop's geological makeup. Yet Denise and her co-workers persistently worked on the hard stone, and bit by bit, the granite yielded. Denise introduced me to the sandblasting room. It was a kind of holy space for her. That it's an industrial space, too, may seem strange, but it also makes sense. After all, memorials are made here. Memorials to honor people's lives, memories, and maybe a divine power that's greater than us. We stood side by side in silence as we watched an automated sandblaster machine shoot tons of sand across a granite memorial in slow, methodical motions, from left to right, then up a bit, then right to left, then up a bit more, and so on, and so on. Even though there was a protective screen, I could still feel grains of sand whipping against my body as it moved. Most people think of hammers and chisels when they think of carving stone. Sandblasting is a different and relatively new carving process. It was introduced in the 1920s to carve less complex embellishments into stone memorials. 
In sand blasting, a high-pressure hose blasts fine-grained sand over a stone covered in a stencil, exposing some parts and protecting others in order to create letters and designs. Imagine holding a hose that exerts hundreds of pounds of pressure, eight hours a day, five days a week. I've used a palm sander for some home projects before and felt my hand going numb in just under 30 minutes. Denise did sandblasting by hand for most of her life. I recorded Denise's oral history in 2017. Her story is performed by Sharon or Sky Forrest. When I was probably 12 or 13 or whatever the age was at the time, I started playing hockey. It was just exciting, and my cousins played on a different team. There were four teams in Barrie for Pee Wees at the time. Now there's the Mites, and it goes all the way up, and there's a ton of teams, and they all travel. The next group for me to be in would have been the Bantam team. I wasn't allowed to play on that because it was a travel team and girls weren't allowed to play. I got my one year in as a peewee. A lot of people around here know of Amanda Pelkey, who plays hockey. Well, her dad grew up across the street from me. He wants to do an article sometime in Sports Illustrated or something about his daughter and have me be a part of that article as the first girl hockey player. I broke the ice, so to speak, for his daughter to play. Now she's in the Olympics. I never felt discriminated against or felt different. I just went in and I did my job. I worked in a lot of different granite plants. I remember talking to my cousin who owned a granite plant at the time. The sandblast place within his company was run by a different company, and I said, are they still looking for somebody? And he said, yeah. He said, Roger's just running his butt off night and day because this guy's out on disability. He talked to Roger, and he called me back, and he said, yep. Roger said to come on down. He'd like to meet you. And I said, okay. He started chuckling, and I said, what did he say? He goes, a girl. You mean a girl works in the granite industry? And then, of course, I got hired down there. Every place I've worked, I never felt any different than anybody else that worked there. I could pull my own weight. I could do anything that needed to be done. There's never been any issue, probably because I just felt like I should be there. I've never felt like oh my gosh, what are they going to think because there's a woman coming in? I've always just gone in. There was never any issue with that. In sandblasting, once the stone is to proportion, the right size you want it, when it comes in, they use a 3M rubber stencil. At that time, everything was on a transparent, full-size stencil, and we would have to rub everything off and cut around all the flowers, all the lettering. We would pull the panels out, put them on what was called a piece of mylar, and run them through a letter press. Then the guy that starts off the process, he brings it into a room and uses a steel saw and takes the polish off. If there's any flowers to be designed, he goes in there with a helmet and protective gear, and he carves out or shapes out the flowers and the leaves and everything in there. When that process is done, it goes into what's called second cut, and we put two coats of adhesive in it, put the panels back in, put the flowers back in, and then cut out the veins for the flowers and the centers for the flowers. And all that gets pounded down, and then at that point it goes in and actually gets sandblasted. It's a pretty good-sized nozzle hose with a quarter-inch to three-eighths inch nozzle with about 120 pounds of pressure. Now everything is drafted and it's all pre-cut, so when we get the stencil, the design and everything is already on it. So they just have to cut out around what's called the sandblast lines and pull it out. 
The shaping's still the same. The sandblasting is still the same. But we don't have to run things through the letterpress anymore. There's a lot of steps that are saved. So if you have a big scenery job, you're not sitting there with your knife and trying to cut around all of the waves and the rocks and the mountains. You just pull it all out. That's all drafted on the computer now using CAD, computer-aided design. Everything used to be pretty much cut by hand. While there was machines that would saw the big blocks, after that, a lot of it was cut by hand. We have one machine now that's called a CNC, Computer Numerical Control Machine, and you can put a rough piece of stone on there and they get it all computerized and all set, and they can make it all polished. It can make it a fancy top. It can do raised letters that would take a hand carver a long time. It can do sculpting. I've seen a couple of pieces that they practice on that's got sculpture in it, and it's got raised letters. But we do have a guy that cuts stone, and he's actually a finisher as well. He does the tool background on the letters and can do some pretty fancy stuff besides cut stone. But then at the other end of the spectrum is somebody with a splitting maul, and then somebody else with a big splitting hammer, and they're just breaking off pieces. At one end, you've got a million dollar plus machine, and on the other end, you literally have guys doing it the old fashioned way to break out a block. However, I think once the machine has more people able to run it, they'll be able to do more. But you still have to sometimes use the old splitting hammer and maul to break stone up. We don't use it so much for the hand carving, but more for the special shapes and all the polishing. This machine has endless possibilities, and we've had it up and running for a little over a year. There's more and more that can be done with this machine. Some of the sheds do have it, but the biggest problem is getting somebody with a computer savvy and the granite savvy to know how to do it. Some plants have gone through guys trying to figure out how to run it. There are a fair amount of guys in the industry that wouldn't even know how to turn a computer on. Same thing about using it for work. Another thing that happens in most plants right now is that they want everybody to know a little bit of everything. But for the most part, if you're a sandblaster, you're going to be sandblasting. If you do first cut, you're going to do first cut. You might do a little shaping, but for the most part, people have a specific job, and that's pretty much where they stay. I've worked at enough places where I've learned other things, and probably if I really pushed it in some of these places, I could have moved into a different realm. But for me... I very much always enjoyed the actual sandblasting part, seeing it finally just come together. I've known people that shuffle papers all day long and feel like they never get anywhere. And every day, I would finish anywhere from 8 to 15 stones. I've always been one to do more of the physical end of work. It is a physical job. People used to say, oh, how can you do that all day? It's so physical. Well, back in my 20s and 30s and even in my 40s, it's like, no, it's not that physical. I said that until my mid-50s, like 57, when my hands just couldn't do it anymore. Over time, you get the numbing and the tingling and while I was sandblasting, my hands would go a little numb. That wasn't the issue as much as the severe, sharp, burning pains in the middle of the night in my hands. There was just nothing I could do. I would just sit up straight, and they'd be in so much pain. But I'd go back to work every day, and I'd sandblast, and half the time my hands were pretty much asleep. I think it was my body having the memory of what to do that I never dropped a hose. My body knew what it was doing, even though my hands were asleep. I went out on workers' comp in the middle of August. 
The severe part of the pain really kicked in when I went back to work in April. It started hurting in May. I went to a chiropractor, and then I went to PT. I've tried everything, because I really wanted to make it until Christmas, when the shed closes for four to six weeks. But when I went to the doctors and they sent me for a nerve conduction test, my right hand was serious, almost irreparable, and my left hand was moderate to serious that I just had to stop. The neurologist pretty much said, with your right hand, don't do anything with it. Don't pick up a glass of water. So I ended up having both hands done, one in October and one in November. I can't sandblast anymore. There's a guy now that's probably in his early 50s, and yeah, he's not a very big guy, and it doesn't really matter if you're big or not, I guess. But he said his hands that it's not going to take much more. I imagine if he went to a neurologist and had the testing done, he would have damage. But when that's what you do for a living, it's part of the job. I would imagine within the next couple years, he won't be able to do it anymore. There's some guys that have done it all their lives and they're retired. But even guys that I know that are using an X-Acto knife all day, which isn't so hard on your hands, their hands are falling asleep, but they don't have the pain. It's not as much pressure. But I walk by and they're shaking out their hands every once in a while because their hands are falling asleep. That is one of the side effects, so to speak. I was fortunate. The guy that's sandblasting now... His hands are really falling asleep, and there wouldn't be anything now that he could move into. This one guy in particular, he wouldn't be able to fall into a position like mine. And sandblasting, the actual sandblasting part, is basically all he's ever done. He wouldn't be able to move into a different part of sandblast because he really doesn't know how to second cut. He certainly wouldn't be able to draft. When his time comes, he'll probably be done. He has plantar fasciitis on his feet, and he put it off. He was diagnosed with that a couple years ago, like in February or March, and he was told he needed the surgery, but he said, work is starting back up, I can't do it now. He waited until Christmas. The less he could walk, the more weight he put on, and then when they went to do the surgery, he waited too long. I don't know what is entailed in that surgery on feet, but instead of making two cuts, they did five in each one. Now he can barely walk. He was working four hours a day and wasn't getting any better. He's like 48 or 49. He's going to be applying for disability. There's probably other jobs down the road. He could probably get out of the industry or in the industry, maybe driving a truck or driving a forklift or doing something like that. But right now, his doctor said four hours on his feet even though he's not standing the whole time, is too much for him to do and his feet aren't getting any better. It was a sad day. The median age with most of the guys that we have now, except for this kid that recently started, most of them are in their 40s and 50s. It's going to be a pretty sad industry pretty soon. When I first started, there was around 800 or 900 granite cutters in the Union. Now we're down. With all the sheds combined, including Rock of Ages and all their different contracts, there's about 350, 360. Some of that is these bigger companies sucking up the little companies, and some of it's automation. What used to take four or five guys to do a job now it's all done with computerized automation. It cuts out a lot of that. 
but we definitely need more people in the industry because there's not going to be enough people to do the work, and the work is there. Since Global Values bought a manufacturing plant and all these other businesses, we've probably gone from eight union workers up to probably 25 or more right now, probably closer to 30. Nobody's coming up anymore. We basically have to steal somebody from another shed, which we did last week. We hired somebody from Rock of Ages last week, and he's going to start Monday working for us. Some of the guys I worked with back 20, 25 years ago, when they were in high school, they went through a granite industry program at Spalding High School. They went right from high school right to work. Some of them were working their summer of their junior, senior year in the sheds. Right now, that exposure is not there at school, and some families, some fathers, are probably like, I don't want my kid to do this. This is hard work. And then there's the other spectrum where some kids are like, I'm not doing that. That's hard work. It's dirty. It's kind of sad because I know what the benefits are. You get health care and dental. There's a pension plan. You can join a 401k and your income will go up within a year or two and you'll become a journeyman and you'll get like 22 bucks an hour. There are some sheds that advertise, willing to train. Whatever it takes, we need them. I'd like to see more young people getting involved into the labor movement. I know the Workers' Center has helped over the years to try to get daycare centers and nursing homes and get more people in general into safe union jobs where you have strict standards and safe employment. You're still going to have some of the same old bullshit, but you got a little, you got something behind you. Now I do more of the paper shuffling. I'm an expediter now. They realized I was also very good at moving paper around and remembering where stones are. We put 150 stones out a week, and probably at least half of those are rush jobs, so I have to know where they are and what's going on with them. I also work on the wash stand. I wash the stones. I'm a little bit everywhere now. I'm incredibly busy. The man that I work for lives in Chicago. He didn't grow up in the industry. He just bought into the industry. He's originally from India, but he decided, I don't know what made him decide to get into the granite industry because his background is computers. He's a computer genius and owns a software company, and somehow he decided to do this. When I first started working for him, it was all imported granite, and we would sandblast it or sell it blank. Then he bought another company so he could have his own building, because we were leasing where we were in the hopes of starting to do some manufacturing. A year later, he bought another business right next door that does manufacturing. So all of a sudden, we've gone from just a small area to now we're working out of two places and manufacturing and manufacturing the granite, I don't think he realized what he was getting into. A lot of us said, don't do it. Do not do it. It's a lot more than you think it is. So now we're scattered around. And then last year, he bought another business. He bought Montpelier Granite Works, but none of them are as big as the place where we used to lease, where we had all our stock inside because we probably had five or 6,000 pieces. So some of it's in warehouse, and some of it is outside, and it's not as organized as it was. So that gets frustrating when you got to try to find a stone, and it's outside, and it's in a crate and everything, but it's still kind of wet. Or in the wintertime, it's cold. We can't work on it right away. And you got to heat it up with heat lamps, but you can't heat it up too fast because it could crack. Nowadays, sometimes I just feel like we're just gerbils, just going and going and going and going and not getting anywhere. It's just so crazy busy at work. I don't have the joy of 
I love my job and I want to get up and go to work and just go right to it. Sometimes I wish I could just be right in that sandblast room. They call it a blowing room and just do my thing. But with my hands, I can't do that anymore. That was Sky Forest performing Denise's story. Sky is currently a home care worker. She has also worked as a welder, a very male dominated career, in addition to other male dominated positions. Like Denise, she is a passionate and dedicated worker who thinks a lot about the future the future of Barry, the future of work, and the future of the working class. My name is Sharon Skye Forrest. I am a woman who is 65 years old, who's lived in Vermont since 1982, and I'm very happy to be living here. I find the culture and community is just what I was hoping for, and it keeps getting better. I've always been impressed by Goddard College and the things that happen here. I'm really thrilled to be part of a project that is paying attention to these issues, and I appreciate the opportunity to contribute in this small way. I found it really interesting that she, like me in many ways, decided that the way to break into this world of work was by being competent and being confident. I really think we all are trying to do our best, and we need circumstances where that's going to happen. And part of it is just how you decide to present yourself. I tried really hard not to get worn down by the sexism that was present, but I also think I tried to understand it and work with it as well as around it. I've had several experiences in my life where I was the only woman at a job and had to work with that. The first time I encountered that is when I was a cab driver in Boston, and they wouldn't let women drive after dark. I had to really rally to show my boss that that looked like sexual discrimination to me. The next time I encountered that is when I was a welder in a shipyard, electric boat in Groton, Connecticut. Again, I was the only woman in the training program, and I had to work pretty hard to establish myself. I was an artist, so I could do really good welds, and once my peers saw that I was able to do the job, they let me alone and actually supported me after a while. The next time I encountered that, I was working for a data processing company in Boston, and I was the only woman working on the third shift. And initially, I was treated differently. But again, once I showed I was competent, it really wasn't an issue, and I got great support. And maybe the last time I had to deal with this, I was working for a company that manufactured computer-based telephone systems. And because I was a teacher, I was hired to work with the training centers. I pretty quickly became director of technical training for the United States, which was a really big job at the time. There were very few women working in the field of telephony, and certainly not very many women in management. I found when I went to my first training center, I walked into the room, and the gentleman waiting to be taught would ask me to go get them coffee, which I gladly did. I returned a few minutes later as the teacher of the course they were taking, and they were quite shocked by that. It took a little while for me to establish some credibility, but then again, competence trumps their concerns. And I found that I had to work to be really competent in all those positions so that I could overcome that barrier of sexual discrimination. It's been a lifelong quest of mine to show that women are able. And I have two daughters and two sons, and I'm trying to make sure that they understand that clearly too. Oh, I remember there was a lot of swearing when I walked into the room and walked to the front of the room and started teaching, and it took a little while for them to give me much credence. Obviously, I knew more about the product than they did, or they wouldn't be there, but they had also been in the field for a really long time, and they felt that that gave them some superiority. Over time, it really did come down to good communication on my part and accepting that we had really different perspectives on things. And eventually they listened to me. I also think it's always important to give people credit for the experience that they have. 
and to show that you value their experience if you want them to value yours. I think if you don't start with a relationship, people aren't going to hear you. I am a compassionate, nurturing person. And in all of my work, I think compassionate communication has been the most um, important feature to me. And I've brought it to every kind of career. It's an easier thing to be in a field where there are more women and where there are women who have the same perspective I do about providing care. On the other hand, there's a little bit less credibility. When I tell somebody I'm a home care provider, even though the type of care I provide is really difficult and work they wouldn't want to do, it doesn't seem to have the same weight as other careers that I've had. It's interesting. I've just started another job doing marketing for a firm, and now that I've got this title of marketing director, I feel like, once again, I have more credibility than home care provider. And it's just really sad. I've also been a teacher, a special educator. And again, you know, those fields that are female-dominated because we have the wherewithal to provide what other people need are often discounted because most of the people in that field are women. And it's sad, and I think it's changing. And I'm really thrilled to see more dads being primary care providers and things shifting in lots of ways, but it'll be a long time before our culture makes the changes that will need to happen. I'm really excited about women being more involved in politics, too. So I'm very hopeful, but I'm also trying to be realistic about how long it will take for change to occur. I kind of shy away from trying to advocate for increased pay because I know that all of the caring professions are ones that are underpaid And I want to make sure that our work is valued no matter how much we're paid. I don't know how it would work to have a union, but I think it's really worth exploring. I think the more we can shed a light on what is unfair in labor practices, the more all of us benefit. And really, we're living in the state that has the second oldest population in the country. And providing care for other people is the future of everybody who lives in Vermont as we age. Uh, So there's no time like the present to pay attention to making sure that people who provide care are well compensated for. We're going to need that. It's interesting. I never have been part of a union. I worked in fields where unions were a presence, but not for a long enough time to get involved in that. I certainly believe in unions and the incredibly important work they do, and I support that from the outside. I think that the tide is going to turn and it will catch us. I think what will happen is that we, again, I'm really focused on aging because I'm 65 myself and a lot of my friends are becoming older quickly. I think that careers where we're caring for each other and taking care of basic needs are going to soon become the ones that machines can't do and they will be valued again in a new way. No machine is going to be able to help an older person stay in their home. There might be some robotics, but that's not going to do much. So it's going to come down to a physical labor, helping somebody get up, get dressed, get out of bed, um, doing some repairs on their home when they're not able to do them. The things that we might not value so much now or the trades, the ones that really can't be done by computers are going to become valued again, and maybe there will be some equilibrium there. Um, I'm an artist as well, and I know that computer-assisted design has um, been a big deal in lots of fields related to the you know, production of visual art. But again, some people are forgetting how to draw. And so I think it'll all come around that our need to do skills that can only be done by humans, that are only about human care and interaction, will once again be valued. And there are many things that just are not going to be able to be done by computers. And I think we need to, over time, kind of share our fascination with what we're able to do on a computer level to the fascination we should have for each other as really competent bodies and people and nurturing presences that computers just aren't going to be able to replicate. We can't mechanize those human connections. And we're finding 
it's a beautiful thing that through our ability to do scientific research, we're getting more and more evidence for how critical it is to have human connection with each other. So it's all being supported to good end. The more we can mechanize jobs that do cause physical harm, the more we can provide a workforce that can do the other types of works that computers can't replicate. And I think it all does come down to, this is going to sound really hokey, but I try to say it everywhere I go, it really comes down to love, that we really need to love each other. And I think that's what we're here for, to become better at it. And there are many ways to do that in all parts of our lives, including in the workplace. And you could just see the compassion that Denise had for her fellow workers. And that came from love for them um, and love for her work, which is why she invested so much of her effort into doing the work well. So I think that's what we need to attend to. How can we love each other, love our work, invest in a way that really comes from the heart? Before I left Denise at her workplace, Global Values, we spent some time with one more automated machine. Tucked away in the back, against the jazz-like movements of laser engravers, sandblasters, boxers, cutters, janitors, and office workers, was a giant computer numerical control machine, or CNC machine, doing its own carving, grinding the granite down in a meticulous grid-like pattern. The machine was cordoned off with large sheets of plexiglass. It looked like a small ice arena, but with no skaters, just the Zamboni. Inside, it looked wet, slick, cold. Along with the humming of the machine, there was a loud hissing whoosh of water jets constantly running down the machine's blades to keep the dust down. There is a computer terminal on the outside but it only requires occasional human input. Denise told me there weren't many workers with the programming skills to even use it. The working class in this country have been forced to the outside, to the margins, to the edge of a precipice. And we are afraid, but we are the edge. We are the bedrock. We are the triumphant mountains. With us, you've got something underneath you With us, you've got something behind you. With us, you've got something ahead of you. We are the shifting ground, and nothing moves without us. As Skye said, how can we love each other and work and invest in a way that comes from the heart? How can we move forward with love, with justice? How do you think about class? Did you relate to Denise's story? How has your job or life been affected by automation and technology? This may be the last episode of the season, but we can keep the conversation going. You can post your stories on our Facebook page, send us a tweet at Enmasse Podcast, or email us at enmassepodcast at gmail.com. That's E-N-M-A-S-S-E podcast. Thank you for listening. We have additional materials and show notes on our website. While there, you can give us feedback or suggestions for the next season. But I can't make another season without your support. This is an independently produced show. My support comes from you, my listeners. 
Go to onmasspodcast.com slash donate to show your support. Special thanks to our performer, Sky Forest, and our storyteller, Denise Gilmet, for this episode. The song, John Henry, at the beginning of our show is from the Alan Lomax Collection at the American Folklife Center, Library of Congress, used courtesy of the Association for Cultural Equity. I'm Liz Medina. This is On Mass, bringing you stories of struggle and hope from the working class. John Henry told his captain.